Did you understand that I was saying that dad was at the train mm -hmm. stop? Okay. Hi everybody, so today I'm going to teach you about how to make reasonable inferences on standardized tests. So this video was inspired by one of my students recently. He's been scoring really well on his practice exams, 1560, 1570, 1580. But despite scoring really, really high test scores, he's also been asking a lot of really insightful questions. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Joey. I'm the perfect score tutor. I've gotten perfect scores on the SAT and ACT, and I have coached I think now about nine students to perfect scores. I have two more students that I'm expecting to get perfect scores on this upcoming fall exam, so I'm keeping my fingers crossed for them. But in the meantime, I wanted to share some advice for you so that you can learn how to better approach standardized testing yourself. So before we dive into some of the advice I have for you, I just want to go over a few little caveats. So when you're prepping for the SAT and ACT, you have to understand that these tests are unlike tests that you'll prep for at school. They don't just test knowledge, they also test reasoning ability. So with the wrong answers that you'll see on these tests, these will exploit fundamental flaws in student reasoning. So my goal here is to give you some tools so you can overcome those fundamental flaws. I truly believe that these tests are all about understanding the holistic content that goes into them. So you wanna make sure that while you're prepping, you spend time building on your academic foundations as well. My approach to test prep is that I want to provide students with the solid foundations while exposing them to the test questions so they can combine the two to get higher test scores. So in the following few slides and examples, I will be using real retired SAT or ACT questions or questions that are strongly inspired by those questions. And I encourage you to do the same as you're prepping for the test. So this is just an image that showcases how a lot of teachers teach inference. So then teachers are like, okay, now let's look at the text and then use some of the background knowledge that you have from your own personal life experience to kind of fill in the gaps. So the SAT writers completely understand this. And so then they have their own formula to inference questions. So on the SAT and ACT, this is how you're supposed to infer. So you're supposed to take text-based evidence and you're supposed to take some of your reasoning, but you're not supposed to take any of the assumptions that you have from your life experience. And your goal in inference questions is to make the smallest assumption possible. Okay, so I have this first example here. If you need some time to read it, make sure to pause the video right now. So this passage is an easy one to make some small inferences about, right? So if there's a lightning bolt in the sky, we can maybe infer that there's a small storm going on. Um, we can infer that I have a dog because it says, I hope my dog wasn't too scared. But then what are some unreasonable assumptions that we can make about this passage? Well, an unreasonable assumption would be like, I'm scared of storms or my dog always gets this way when there's a storm in the sky. So here's another example, and this one I was able to pull from a retired ACT exam. Take a couple seconds to pause the video and read it. So what are some reasonable inferences you can make from this passage? Well, maybe the narrator was just on a train because the narrator just stepped off a train, right? Another question that they did actually ask on the ACT was, who do you think was there to greet the narrator? And then a lot of students will be like, oh, well, it says long enough to beat your dad in two games of cribbage. And so a lot of students will read that line and be like, oh, okay, well, somebody's mentioning your dad, so then maybe your dad isn't there, right? But the fact is that you had to infer that there were probably two people at the train stop and that while they were waiting for the narrator to arrive, that they were playing a game of cribbage, which is like chess or something. I don't know. If you actually know what cribbage is, leave a comment below. Okay, so here's another example from an ACT exam. This one's much longer, so pause the video if you need a second. So then this entire passage talks about this metaphor of some wild little bird, right? And then when students read it, they're like a little bit confused. They're like, why is this person a bird? Why are they a pigeon? Where are they? So were you able to figure out what this paragraph was actually about? Well, the implication here is that the mom had given up her daughter for adoption and that somehow she had found the mom and written her a letter. Were you able to figure that out? If not, feel free to leave a question below and I can further clarify. So um, let's get to some real test questions so that you can prepare for the exam. So what's an inference question? Here's some keywords that you wanna look out for to recognize these inference questions. 
So how do you recognize an inference question? Well, here on the screen, I have a few different keywords that usually come up for an inference question. So you have infer, imply, most likely. So anytime you have this sort of like hypothetical language, like what if, that's when you know that you're gonna make the tiniest assumption possible. So I split up inference questions into five different types. So the first type is just a general inference question. So this is the question that my student brought up to me. And it says, it can reasonably be inferred from the passage that MMA, that's Mademoiselle Ramatsway, considers Mademoiselle Makutsi to be. And then the student went through the entire passage and all they found was this one line about Mademoiselle Makutsi. And so you can see from the passage that they're just talking about that she was owning some sort of small little agency or that she was an employee, right? And so when you wanna make an inference, then you wanna go with something very broad that's difficult to argue with. The best one in this case is D, generally satisfactory as an employee, because that allows you to infer that maybe there were times that she wasn't satisfactory. It's also a reasonable assumption because if she was generally satisfactory, she wouldn't have been fired, right? So let's look at some of the other answers, right? Often erratic. I can't tell from a single line how often she does anything. Um, C, unreasonably demanding, like I don't know if it's reasonable or not. Those are things that are really difficult to argue or find from the text. And then A, somewhat unambitious. I like the word somewhat for inference questions, but again, if she was unambitious, I don't know if she would still be employed by the lady in the passage, right? So here, D is the best answer. So I have a couple other inference questions types, and you can recognize these inference questions because they say most likely agree, right? And these are about authors. Um, these are from historical passages, but you can apply this to other types of passages. Um, so 36, both authors would most likely agree with which statement. Well, notice how A says they fail. That is an absolute statement, right? B is an absolute statement too. They are incapable. Um, D, D is okay, right? It says they value personal mor morality. Um, so maybe the passages are about morality, but I haven't included them in the passage or on the screen for you to look at, right? Here, so it, C is the best answer here because it says they may not be acting in accordance with justice, right? But that leaves room for interpretation because they could also be acting in accordance. So that type of open-ended vague response tends to be more correct, especially when you're trying to answer broadly, answer like, what would the authors think? So take a second for number 40 and think about what might be the best answer here then. For number 40, I hope you thought about the answer D. This one's the best one. They generally enjoyed fewer rights, right? So if they generally enjoyed fewer rights, that also could imply that sometimes they had more rights than men. So here, um, so here students kind of get thrown off by the word enjoyed. This is a historical uh, passage. So here, sometimes students get thrown off by the word enjoyed. This is a historical passage. And when you use the word enjoy, it doesn't mean like, ha ha, I'm happy. Enjoy is just another synonym for the word had. The women at that point in time generally had fewer rights than men. Okay, inference question type number two. So these are direct statements. These are the easiest ones. So you wanna try this approach first. So here we have the author of the passage suggests that crowds may be more effective at. So you see the question stem, right? So then you'd want to go through all the answer choices and see which one directly answers the question. You want a line that supports it, right? So the one that best supports it is line 11 through 14. So it says your guess is probably going to be far from the mark, whereas the average of many people's choices is closer to the true number. So here, the word many people is a synonym for the word crowds. And then we go to the answer and it says that many people are gonna be close to the true number. And then we make our tiniest little translation. It still is a direct statement though. And we choose C, which says arriving at accurate quantitative answers. So what the test did here is they literally took just synonyms of the phrase and put into the answer choice. So here's another inference type question. This is from the narrative passage, the first passage on any exam. And so, if you need a second again, you can pause, right? But the question is asking about how Widow Lau is reluctant to stay for tea. And so I always go to the answer choices first. 
And I think it's pretty obvious that it's 15 through 18. Most of my students choose this one. And it says, Old Whittle Lao refused their invitation three times, exclaiming that my father and uncles must be too busy for visitors. And then students are like, oh, okay, too busy for visitors. It's probably C, right? Because the shop is unusually busy. Ha ha, I'm so smart. I outsmarted the test. So here's where you need to take a pause and understand that you're being asked an inference question. Remember, inference questions should not be typically answered word for word. You have to make a tiny little assumption here. And what students forget to do is they forget to keep reading. The line goes all the way to the word leave. It says she made weak efforts to leave. So she's saying one thing, but her body language is showing something else. So then you can infer that her reluctance to stay for tea is feigned. Feigned here means faked because she is not genuinely firm in her resolve. So this line right here is actually a direct translation of she made weak efforts to leave. Okay, so inference question type number three, you just gotta look a little bit elsewhere. So here's an example where it says the passage implies that American cities in 1974. So again, the question stem is really clear. So I just included the part about 1974. So again, students typically don't miss the lines here because it's very clearly labeled in the paragraph. So it has all this text over here and it describes what the cities were like in downtown where they had the this and the that and the other thing. And so the way to best answer this question is you kind of go look a little bit earlier where they define what the four urban and suburban zones of settlement are. It says there's a central business district, an area of manufacturing. So it defines all these things for you so that when later you see the text, you can see that it supports that definition they gave you. So the best answer for 16 is C. So now we get to inference question type number four, where things get just a little bit more difficult. So this one is answering what is not being said. So which of the following does the author suggest about female goats mentioned in 59? So if we look here, it says, then they implanted the eggs in the wombs of female goats. When the kids were born, so kids are baby goats, some of them proved to be transgenic. And then they put the comma here and define what transgenic means. It means the human gene was nestled safely in their cells. So I love the word some on the test because it's really easy to infer the opposite. If some of the kids were born transgenic with the human genes in their cell, then we also have some kids who were not transgenic. A really easy inference to make. And then we just have to go back a little bit in the text to see what antithrombin is, right? So antithrombin is a human gene. So these scientists were injecting a human gene into the cell so that we can infer then that some of the kids were not born with the antithrombin gene. Here's another example of answering what's not being said. So what does the author imply about pelicans, storks, and geese? Again, we go to the question stem, right? So this is the only paragraph that talks about pelicans, storks, and geese. So the correct answer here would be somewhere in the 40s, right? And this is the only one that's in the 40s. Okay. This finding likely applies to other long-winged birds. So I didn't include the rest of the passage, but uh, the passage was about ibises, which is a type of bird. So we can infer then that ibises are also long-winged birds. And then the line that we have underlined says that small birds create more complex wakes. So then we can infer the opposite then. If the small birds have complex wakes, then the big birds will have less complex wakes. So then we go to the answers, right? And then we don't see an answer that says the big birds have less complex wakes, but we do see a nice general stand-in. It says that all these long-winged birds have a similar wake to that of ibises. So they took it one step further and took the idea and used broad language to represent that idea. So this type of question is gonna be the hardest type of entrance question. I call it the double negative question. It's most likely gonna show up on historical passages and science passages because there's lots of relationships in those passages. 
So the question says the passes suggests that if, right? So now we need to hypothesize if Seidel had planted wheat and corn on the two agricultural strips in the experiment, the percentage of the surface of each strip covered with weeds would most likely have been. So I copied all the lines that were in question, right? And so the correct line for this one is 55 through 57. It says, no crops were planted in these pilot experiments to avoid competition with emerging weeds. So then sometimes on these science passages, I kind of write out what the relationship is, right? So no crops, if no crops were planted, that equals no competition. And then what do you have to infer about no competition? If there's no competition, then that means your plants are going to grow more. I think that's a reasonable inference, right? So then the question asks, what would happen if you planted wheat and corn? Well, you need to understand that wheat and corn are types of crops. So then if you have yes crops, then you will have yes competition. And then instead of growing more, whatever you're growing is going to grow less. So then the correct answer is that if we planted the wheat and corn, then the weeds would likely have grown at a lower percentage than what we found. Okay, so I hope some of these examples made sense. And if you're prepping for the test, I kind of want you to go in the order of thought processes that I gave you, right? Try with a general inference, then try with a direct one, then try going down the list, boom, 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 boom. But here's some key takeaways for you. Number one, make sure you're answering the question. Often the questions will ask you to consider a specific person or a specific idea, and this is where students mess up first, right? They find a line that doesn't answer what the question is asking about. Number two, be wary of evidence that uses exact wording from the test. Because often with these inference questions, you're not supposed to be using word-for-word -word answer choices. And what the test writers do is they'll take the copy-paste and then they'll add a word like not or hardly to make the answer untrue. Tip number three, be careful of words or modifiers that are hard to quantify or measure. So some of the examples, usually, how often is usually? I don't know. Always? Can you measure that? Do you know that 100% of the time something's happening? Um, rarely. Again, I don't know what rare is. So be careful of those types of words. Similarly, you want to be careful of words that are overly extreme. So I should have actually said always here, right? Do you know that it always happens 100% of the time? So words like majority, which is another very specific word. Majority means over 50%. Words like same, right? Do you know that there's an exact amount that's equal to? So then instead, you should be looking words that are vague enough to leave room for interpretation. So instead of same, you could use the word similarly. Instead of the word many, you could use a word like some. So this was a lot of information really quickly. So if you have any questions or concerns, feel free to leave a comment below. Otherwise, I wish you the best as you're prepping for the SAT and ACT. Mm -hmm.